Well, hi and welcome to church today. Hopefully you've had an incredible week. We're so glad that you've joined us today and we're so expecting for what God's going to be doing in the meeting. That's right. We trust you've come with an open heart ready to receive, but don't keep it to yourself. If there's somebody in your world who you know needs to hear from the Lord, send them a text now and invite them to stream our services on one of our online platforms. You know, in this season, you don't even need to jump in your car to come to church. In fact, you don't need to change, brush your teeth, shower or put on makeup. You just need to jump onto one of our online platforms and be part of the service experience today. Although maybe you just brush your teeth for that Jesus. That would be, might, good. Might be good. <laughs> That'd be good. Now we're streaming today from our foyer at our Santon campus because we can't meet together in person, but we love the fact that you're visiting us online. The great thing about online church is we're connecting with people around the world. So no matter which time zone you are in, you are so welcome and we're so glad that you've chosen to be part of our service. Now, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about who we are as a church, we'd love for you to pop over to our website and you can download a brochure and it gives you a little bit more information. That's right. We created the brochure with you in mind to give you any information you might be looking for if you are looking for a new church home. So if you're from the Gauteng or the KZN areas, this might just be the church for you. Head over to the website and if you'd like somebody to get in touch, please feel free to leave your details as well. Now, something else that's available on our website is our kids ministry. Every single week, our team's there labor to put together age-specific ministry for your little ones. Now, I know, Dev, you and Nats have been totally enjoying this season at home with your kids. Our kids love Kids Zone. They go muggy for the praise and worship. They love the ministry. So we can only encourage you to help your kids get onto a device so that they can enjoy their own age-specific ministry that they'll absolutely love. Well, Dev, we've enjoyed the foyer, but it's that time of the meeting when we're going to be heading into the main auditorium for a time of praise and worship. I really want to encourage you, try and find a moment to be intimate with God. Pastor Andre and Pastor Vilma are going to be praying specifically for needs, so be expectant for what God's going to be doing in this service. Praise you, Lord. And let's lift our voice and sing.
praise you, Lord. We lift our voice and we give you all the glory, God. Thank you that you are here. We're in our homes. You're not standing beside us, God. In this moment. Thank you, Jesus. Let me see. Skies spin their dance within your breath. Time runs its ways within your head. And my mind runs wild to comprehend. But no mind on earth could understand.
focus on the things that I can't see now. Spirit, breathe like a wind, come have your way. Wasn't it great to worship again? I so enjoy worshiping every Sunday. And the song's words, yeah, now. So encouraging because God is here. You might not feel it, but He's here now. In a moment, we're going to pray, but I just want to encourage you with this very briefly. You know, Solomon, when he was just a young king, God appeared to him. And you know what the Lord said to him? He said, ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. What a gracious God we serve. And then we know Solomon asked for wisdom. And then God said to him, well, I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you wealth and honor on top of it. And I, I'm so encouraged by that when I, when I read that this week because it reminds me of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians says that God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And notice what God told Solomon, ask me whatever you want. Isn't that a great promise from God, a great opportunity? So we want to pray with you today in the service now. Take an opportunity to pray for various needs. And Pastor Wilman, I've looked through these requests and we are going to pray for some of these today. And uh, she's now going to just encourage you and, we, and she's going to lead us in prayer. Yeah, I read this morning in Isaiah 3 where God speaks to the people and he says, tell the righteous all will be well. And I just felt that it was a, a word uh, from the Lord uh, for me and I don't want to keep it just for myself but I want to share it with everyone tell my people all will be well so I'm, I'm going to pray for health and I'm going to pray for marriages and I'm going to pray for family so perhaps you can stretch your hands towards the screen um, and pray with us as we bring people's needs to the Lord so, Father God, we just begin today by praying for health, Lord. It is such a big issue at the moment, this COVID-19, and so many people um, have been infected, family members, even people within our own congregation. And so we just pray for your healing hand to be upon them, that they will get through this, that they will survive this, um, that they will be able to breathe well, and that miraculously, Lord, things will begin to improve for yeah. patients with this virus, Lord. We pray for fears about the virus, that you will bring peace mm. to people, Father. We pray for those who, outside of the virus, who are just emotionally overwhelmed and yeah. unwell, Father God. We pray for those who are in hospital. We pray for protection, Father God. Yeah. Uh, we pray for those who are working in hospitals and areas where there are customers and shopping centers, supermarkets. Yes. We pray for your hand of protection, Father God. Thank you for those who have survived yes, the COVID-19, Father God. I also bring before you, just reading through the needs in the house, pray for pregnant moms, Lord, mm. those who are fearful of, of the, the days ahead, but that you'll bring your peace uh, to, those, to those parents, mm. Father God. We also pray for those who are hoping to fall pregnant, that those who haven't been able to fall pregnant will miraculously, by your power, be able to conceive and have babies, Father God. We pray for those who are in need of operations, and we pray for those who are in need of checkups, that you'll protect them. And we pray also for those who are depressed and suicidal, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, there's so many requests that you've sent in, prayer requests, and we type them up, as you can see from this document. We go through them, we pray for them. And I just want to, in general today, pray for uh, jobs, exams, uh, yes. people with financial issues. So join with me, whatever your need is, let's hold it before the Lord. Yes. Let's believe for whatever today, and let's trust Him to meet our need. Father, we thank you today that you're the God of our marriages, you're the God of our families, the God of our finances, the God of our exams, the God of our work. You're the God of every area of our lives. And so we bring all these needs to you today. People struggling in trying to find jobs, those trying to open businesses, those trying to uh, increase turnover, pay their staff, those uh, battling in their marriages and their families. Yes, Pray for God. you to bring yes, healing God. to homes, to businesses, yes, uh, create opportunities, and just bless the Rivers Church family yes, with God. all the good things, with whatever they need. Yes, Give it to them today. We trust you in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I've recently finished Boss Andre's latest book, um, The Power of Intentional Living. Such a rich book and practical teaching on how to be excellent in everything that we do. It has really challenged me, especially during this COVID-19 lockdown season, to keep putting clear plans to work instead of just doing enough to survive the season. In society these days, we're seeing more and more of this entitlement mentality where people are expecting handouts and things to be given to them. But Pastor Andre speaks about how God is a creator and we're created in His image to create. And it basically encourages us to make the life that we want and to not just let life happen to us, but to make decisions, to take the actions that will steer our lives in a course that we want to see it go in. Uh, my favorite chapter has probably been chapter two, uh, the mandate to create, specifically the part about vision and the steps you should take and the strategy you should have. I think it's invaluable. I think everybody should read that book. Pastor Andre teaches us that the quality of work and effort that we put in is, is a testament of love to those around us. Um, I'd highly recommend this book to anybody wanting to take themselves to the next level. Church, as we come around our giving today, it's my privilege to encourage us with our giving. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for your faithfulness over the season. Through the uncertainty, through the lockdown, we've been faithful as a church. We've continued to sow. And as a result, we've still been able to worship God. We've been able to continue to reach people. And we've continued to connect with each other. What's more than that, the foundation has been able to help the less fortunate. All because of our giving. So with that in mind, I want to take a look at a scripture in the Bible. It's about Noah. Noah was a man, and you'd be familiar with him, even if you're not familiar with church, who uh, God instructed to build an ark because he was going to send a flood. And Noah builds the ark, and God sends him uh, the animals. They walk in two by two, elephants and the kangaroos. They all went marching in. It's the Sunday school song I used to sing when I was growing up. But as the animals walked in the ark, as Noah's family got in, the, the flood waters came down. But I don't want to take a look at what happens at the flood or before that. I actually want to take a look at what happens immediately after the flood. Bearing in mind, Noah has been in the ark for about a year, most scholars think. So my question is, what would you do? Remember, he was in the ark and there was no essential services that he needed to go do. There was no grocery shopping run. He didn't have to go full petrol in the car. He was locked in for a full year. I don't know, maybe if it was you, you'd be like, what's the Wi-Fi password? Maybe you'd be like, hey man, uh, I just need a break from the homeschooling for a little bit. And maybe I just need to go on a hike. What is it that you do? Because what Noah does is very interesting. In Genesis 8 verses 20 to 21, it tells us, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And there he sacrificed his burnt offerings, the animals and the birds that had been approved for that purpose. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice. You know what's interesting is Noah's response when he walked out the ark was to build an altar. And that's exactly what we've done with online church. It's a form of an altar. You see, an altar is simply this. It's a place or a platform to worship God. And isn't that what we're doing on online church? It's a place and it's a platform to worship God. It's not just entertainment on a Sunday, but it's a platform to worship God. And not only do we build the altar, but we also worship on that altar. That's what Noah did, and that's what we need to do. We need to worship on the altar. At the start of the service when we, uh, when we sung praise and worship, don't just spectate, press in, worship God in those moments and feel His presence. And now as we come to the offering, it's another opportunity to worship God just like Noah did. The Bible tells us that Noah sacrificed animals and burnt offerings. In much the same way, we get to sacrifice to God. We get to bring our offering to God. And Noah may have done it through animals and burnt offerings, but we get to do it through SnapScan and the app and EFTs. And here's a thought that we should ponder on, and it's this, it's that, where did Noah get the animals from? Remember, there was a flood. The whole earth was covered in water. The animals had been drenched in the flood. There were no animals outside the ark, which means that Noah had to get the animals from inside the ark with what little he had in the ark. You see, if you read the Bible in Genesis 7, God tells Noah exactly what to do. He actually says, hey, I've provided and I've purposed extra of this certain animal for you. So when you get to where you need to be, you have something to sacrifice with. Which means that Noah carried his worship with him through the storm, through the flood, through the isolation, and through the uncertainty, just like we do. And what he did was he got to a point where he realized he had what he needed to worship, and we have what we need to worship. You see, God had prepared and purposed something, but it was up to Noah to sacrifice. 
And we need to do the same in our lives. We need to be willing to sacrifice to God because when we do the aroma of sacrifice, it pleases the heart of God. Not only does it please the heart of God, but God responds with His promise because God promises the rainbow after this. And He also responds with blessing because Genesis 9 verse 1 says, God blessed Noah and his sons. So today, church, are we ready to sacrifice on this altar, to give to God, to sacrifice and bring a pleasing aroma to heaven? Well, if you're ready, take a look at this video of how we can give. Giving online is quick, easy and secure. Here's how. You can give straight through the Rivers app by selecting Give at the bottom of your screen, then selecting your campus and the amount that you'd like to give, and you'll be directed to SnapScan to complete your transaction. You can also give directly via SnapScan by scanning the code below. If you'd like to give by credit card, you can also do so by heading over to our website and selecting Give Online. Finally, to give by EFT, use the details below. Well, church, as we finish off our giving, the ways to give are on the screen still. Let's pray and let's commit the giving to God. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the God who sees what we're going through, Lord. And right now we lift up every single giver to you. As we give from what we have, from what you've provided to us, Lord, we know that you will bless us, that you will bless us not just financially, but in all areas of our lives. And as we sow into the church, I pray that the church would continue to grow, continue to reach people, continue to be a platform of hope that is speaking light and life into the situation and into the world. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, it's time for the word now, and I look forward to teaching today. So let's pray together. Let's believe God to speak to our hearts right now. Father, I pray for the spirit of revelation and spirit of insight to come upon all of us as we hear your word taught. Speak into our hearts, our families, our businesses and homes. Give us a word and the word that will help us move through life with victory and with strength. Speak today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Man. Well, as we kick off today, let me tell you a story about a young man. He was just eight years old. Rian Staten was his name. His mother walked out on him at the tender age of eight and left behind his brother, himself, and his dad. And his dad had to hold down several jobs in order to get by. They got into financial difficulties and really struggled. Often the electricity was cut off because they didn't have money. And uh, he eventually left school and took a job working for what we would call the dirt cart in America, the garbage collectors. And so he did this job. Four o'clock in the morning, he'd have to get up. He was working mostly with former uh, prisoners, you know, inmates. But he was spotted one day by one of the owners of the company that he worked for. And uh, this owner, uh, I think it was the owner's son, took him and introduced him to a professor and said, this guy's got potential. He's very bright. Surely we can do something for him. Uh, can you speak to the dean of admissions? Well, with immense support from his brother, he was admitted to university and the Bowie State University he did two years. Then he left there and went to another university uh, called the University of Maryland, where he graduated in 2018. Then he landed a job, a political Political consulting job and he wanted to study for his admission to law school. Pretty amazing thing. So while preparing for that, he sent out uh, letters to all sorts of universities, the, the top universities in the country, you know, let's see what happens and who knows. And Harvard came back and admitted him and uh, he's now studying law at Harvard. You see, the thing about this story is this, his start was really bad. The middle phase of his life was super tough. But in the end, it turned out well because he persevered, got a break, and uh, saw beyond to where he could be as a young man. You know, when you think about things in life, the start of something never determines the end. Think of racing, Formula One racing. Often the fastest car in practice gets what they call pole position, right in front, the, the, the first two places on the grid. But often it's, it's other cars from the back of the grid that win the race because there's so many factors. You know, tires wear out, drivers get tired, there's mechanical failure, uh, they spin off the track, they lose concentration, get bumped by another car. There's all sorts of things that can determine the end, so the start is not always the determining factor. In fact, the last lap often of a race 
can determine a race. And the same is true of our lives. It's not how we start. It's not how anything starts. It's not how the pandemic starts. It's how we find ourselves at the end and will we win or will we not make it to the end? So I want to speak to you today and I want to appeal to you today. This is the title of the message, Making the End Better Than the Beginning. Because it's up to us to make the end of whatever we're attempting better than our beginning. You can have a bad start. You can go through a struggle in the middle. But actually, the end is what we need to keep in mind. And you'll know that the start of this year has been really, really difficult. But that doesn't have to determine how the year ends. The start of this pandemic is not as important as how it actually ends and how we come through it. Think of this. The start of South Africa's democracy in 1994 was glorious. But what's more important is not how it started, but where we find ourselves right now and where we will be in the future and how we will end. And Solomon uses a very interesting word in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He uses the word better seven times in chapter 7. And I want to read you from verse 8. He says, the end of a matter is better than the beginning. Isn't that interesting? And patience is better than pride. And he says that you mustn't then look at how something starts. I want to encourage you, don't look at the flashy beginnings of people. Because some people have a brilliant start in life. They have a massively wonderful upbringing and, and their career seems to take off. They, they seem to buy their new car much sooner than anyone else. But I'll tell you what, the end of a person's life is really much more important than their initial beginnings. And he says here, the end of a matter is better than the beginning. So don't look at how people's marriages start, their businesses start, or how their careers start, or who's got the first to accumulate the most positions, or who's got the brand new house. No, no, no. It's the end of that marriage, that business, that family, that is actually important. Because sometimes things start slow, but they end well. I was reading about the biggest mall in the world, the South China Mall, opened in Dogon, in China in 2005, the world's largest mall, 2,500 stores, a mock Venetian uh, canal, a mock uh, uh, image of the Arc de Triumph, 26 meters in the sky, and 99% uh, of the shops stood empty when that mall opened. They've got this amazing indoor, outdoor roller coaster, 553 meters, but it stood dormant. And for 10 years, it was supposed to attract 70,000 to 100,000 visitors a day. But for 10 years, this thing stood empty. 660,000 square meters, but only a dozen shops were lit. Well, that's not the end of the story. It was a bad start, but they saw the end. They saw the growth of the population in that city. And eventually now, it's 99% occupied, and it's actually booming, and people are attending. So the beginning of something is not always a picture of the end. And we've got to see ourselves currently, where we're, what we're facing right now, we've got to see the end, not the beginning, and not the middle because we're in the middle of a pandemic. But what's the end look like? How will we come through this thing? So let me give you five things that we can do to make the ending better than the beginning. Number one, it's not our start or the middle, but how we finish that counts. It's not how you start. It's not what you're going through when you're in the middle of something, but it's how we finish that really counts. Think of Joseph's dreams on the night that he first had those dreams in the morning when he woke up. He must have been elated. He must have thought, man, my life is going to take off. But then after several years in Egypt, he was in the middle of something he never expected. And that start was a distant memory. But he carried on and he kept the end in mind and he held on to the dreams. And in the end, he went from prisoner to prince. So it's very important not to look at the start or the middle, but to look at how we end. Just this last weekend, Brad Binder won the Czechoslovakian Grand Prix. And um, it was an amazing thing because it was the first South African ever to win motorbike Grand Prix. And so it was celebrated around the world as a historic achievement. But the important thing here is he started from seventh on the grid. His starting place was not right in the front. And he gradually worked his way up through the middle of the race, lap 13. He came into second place. And then he progressed again into first. And by the end of the race, he had won by four seconds, even though he started in seventh spot on the grid. You see, it's not your start. It's not where you are in the middle, but it's where you are at the end. If you keep looking to make the end better 
than your beginning. I'm sure he was disappointed that he was in seventh spot when the race started because there were so many other riders in front of him. But he kept his eye on the end and he made the end better than the beginning. I was reading about this young lady, Rachel Campy, at just 14 years old in the UK. She fell pregnant and at 15 had a baby. She was bullied at school while she was pregnant and the school eventually said, look, you've got to go. We can't handle this pregnancy. And so she left and went to various schools, ended up in York College and then from there ended up having a baby at 15. And then finally she went to university at Leeds and at the age of 21, she got a degree in counseling, psychology, and her daughter was alongside her. She's gone from strength to strength, and she's been nominated as uh, an inspiration by the Yorkshire Choice Awards in the UK, and she wants to continue studying. She wants to be a motivational speaker, and she has become an ambassador for something called MindMate, which is the National Health Service uh, organization that supports young people. So she started off badly. She persevered through her middle, and now she's come to the end of something quite difficult, and she's really, really being successful. You have to keep the end in mind, not just the start and not just the middle, because it's often in the middle of something, like we're in the middle of a pandemic, that it gets the hardest. You wonder, when is this going to end? We, 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 we kind of feel frustrated. But you know, the Psalms tell us in Psalm 119 and verse 62, in the middle of the night, I wake up to praise you for your righteous judgment. So when you're in the middle of something, you've got to keep praising God. At the darkest hour, you've got to keep your eyes on the end and uh, because it's in that moment when you can lose hope and you cannot see the end. You can only experience what you're going through in the middle. It's a bit like a race of faith that we're on, like a motorbike or car race. We're in a race of faith and we've got to keep going. When you start a race, you can be full of energy. When you get to the middle, you begin to tire. Maybe others are overtaking you, but you've got to keep going in the race of faith and you've got to go all the way to the end because whenever you start anything, there's enthusiasm. Even when we started this pandemic, oh, it won't last long. It'll soon be over. We'll all pull together. But month after month after month, now people don't even know when it's going. Some are talking about 2022. So what are we going to do in the middle? We've got to keep running the race and keep our eyes on the end because the end will come and we've got to make the end better than the beginning. The Apostle Paul talks about the race of faith and how he finds himself in the middle of it. And he's honest enough to admit, I'm in the middle of it. But I want you to notice what he says in Philippians chapter 3 and reading from verse 12. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or I've already reached perfection. In other words, I'm not at the end yet. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not yet achieved it. I'm not at the end. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Now, here's the key. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I'm not at the start, he says. I'm in the middle. I haven't got to the end yet, but I'm keeping going because I'm going to stay courageous and committed until the end. And so it's not our start or where we find ourselves in the middle of our Christian walk or this pandemic, but it's keeping our eye on the end because we know we can make the end better than the beginning. The second thing about making the end better than the beginning is see the end of sin, suffering, and temptation, not the middle. Often when you're in the middle of sin, a challenge with sin, a habit, an addiction, or suffering and pain, loss, and, uh, and, and temptation, serious temptation, you can almost feel helpless, but you've got to see yourself beyond it. I can get through this. In fact, years ago, Stephen Covey, the late author, wrote a wonderful book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he lists the habits. And habit number two was very well known because habit number two was this. We need to begin with the end in mind. That's what he says. You always have to begin everything 
with the end in mind. You have to see the goal. And that's a bit like living life by design. You know where you're going. You know where you're going to finish. You know what you're aiming at. And that's how we've got to live. We've got to see beyond temptation, beyond sin and suffering and the things that are currently we're facing. We say, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to win over this. And my life is going to make sense. And you know, Jesus, when he was in the wilderness, was severely tempted. The devil came to him and brought him temptations. And uh, what got him through wasn't just that he was pure and holy, but he saw the end, not just the middle of what he was going through. In fact, Jesus was at the start of his ministry at that point, and he didn't just look a few days ahead. He looked right to the end. And the book of Hebrews tells us that he did this in Hebrews chapter 12. Let me read it to you, because Jesus began with the end in mind. He knew what he was born to do. He knew why he was on the planet. He didn't just live for earthly temptations and earthly pleasures. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. It encourages us. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You know, sin can get a grip on you, even mentally. People don't even know, but mentally you're gripped by negativity, unbelief, doubt, anger, all that bitterness, insecurity. He says, let's throw it off. And he says, and let's us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now let's keep running this race. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, uses him as an example, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In other words, he saw the end, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, Jesus had the end in mind He didn't just look at the beginning. And when you face challenges, suffering, sin, temptation, you've got to think, hang on a minute, let me think about the end of this. I can get past this. I'm going to keep the end in mind. And when you do, it really helps you. You may be going through suffering right now. Maybe you've lost family members. I know a lot of people have lost family members. They haven't been able to visit them in hospital. The funerals have been minimized. So tremendous pressure and suffering on people. But you've got to see beyond that suffering, beyond the grave, to something more. And the Apostle Paul helps us here, points us to the end. Notice what he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. He says, for this light momentary affliction, that's what he calls suffering, light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. He sees the end. He sees heaven. Beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're passing, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You've got to look way beyond your suffering, your challenges, your temptations, to something ahead where you know God's going to bring good out of this. Even if you're going through tremendous pressure at the moment, maybe you're not well, maybe you've lost your business. You know, we need to take courage and realize that they're great men of God who had to look past and see the end when they were facing the same as us. Last weekend when I was preaching from the book of James, something jumped out at me which prompted this message. And I want to read to you what James suggests we do. He also says we need to look past the suffering and the sin and and, and see what other men of God did. James chapter 5 and verse 10. For examples of patience in suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, using them as an example. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. He kept going, but watch this. You see how the Lord was kind to him at the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. You know, when you read that, you can think, well, if God is full of tenderness and mercy, why didn't he just help him in the beginning? Why did he wait till the end? But often God allows things to happen and then he tells us, don't worry, I'm full of compassion and mercy. Keep your eye on the end result because after it all happened, when Job lost his home and his family and his business and his possessions and his children, God gave him back twice as much in the end as he had in the beginning. And when you go through tremendous pressure and suffering, you need to keep the end in mind, because often, you know, it's not what you're going through right now that makes sense, but God is often using it to develop our lives. The Good News Bible says of James chapter 5 how the Lord provided for him in the end. And so God's got something at our end that we need to look forward to. And so we mustn't look at the start or the middle of what we're facing right now.
You know, if you think of how you go through suffering and in the end God works it out, that's how he, he dealt with Israel. The children of Israel uh, were promised great things. In fact, God spoke to Abraham in Genesis and he said, I'm, I'm going to make of you a great nation and you're going to be incredible as many as the sand on the seashore, as the stars in the skies. And, and, and then he suddenly says to Abraham, but they're going, you're, you're, you're going to become such a great nation, but your nation is going to become enslaved for 400 years. Gee, thank you, Lord. That's a, that's a wonderful promise. But now you're pointing to suffering. See, God knows the end from the beginning. He knew that they'd become a great nation. In the middle of their history, they'd be enslaved. But then he knew what the end would be. They would end up in Canaan. And uh, notice here in Genesis chapter 15, and this is mentioned twice in Scripture, Genesis 15, uh, the Lord says to Abraham, I will punish the nation that enslaves them. Notice the wording. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. In the end, you see, God's not just looking at the beginning. He's not just looking at the middle. He's looking at the end. And even Stephen in the book of Acts preaches and mentions the exact same thing. Acts chapter 7. Uh, he's, he's repeating here. He says, but the Lord says, I will punish the nation that enslaves them. God said, and in the end, they'll come out and worship me here in this place. You see, God always sees the end. And we have to look to the end and make the end better than the beginning or the middle, because often he's got a purpose and a developmental plan in the middle of what we're facing. I read an interesting proverb just this week from Proverbs chapter 20, and it says this, an inheritance obtained too early in life is not a blessing in the end. Man, I, I struggled with that as I read that, because you know, if you're 16 or 17 and you've grown up in poverty and now suddenly you're here, man, a relative has left you 10 million rand, you know, a million dollars. You'd be like, wow, this is fantastic. My future is brilliant. But you know, it's always not good in the end because you could be too young to manage money. And we've seen what happens to people when they're not ready to manage money, when they don't have the skills and the wisdom to see ahead. They squander it, they have parties, use drugs, buy all luxury items that have no real lasting value. And so sometimes we need to go through things and then God says, now here's the end of it and it's better than the beginning. Because in the beginning you can have a lot of enthusiasm, but you develop endurance and patience and character as you keep going along. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12 encourages us to keep going and to keep running the race of faith and to not lose our enthusiasm, especially in the middle of this pandemic that we're going through. And it says you be careful then, dear brothers and sisters, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away. Because that's what happens. You start well, but in the middle of it, it gets hard. Turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. That's what suffering and challenges and temptation does. You start to get deceived and you start to get hardened against God. And he says, for if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believe, he says, not just the start, it's the end, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. You see God's promises, we have to see not the start of our faith, not the start of our challenges or even the middle, but we have to keep going to the end through the sin, through the suffering, through the temptations, because we can make our end better than our beginning. Number three, the third way we can make the end better than the beginning is to understand this. We make it to the end when we trust God fully. When we trust God fully and we keep our eyes on him, that's how we get to the end. Because it's so easy to become discouraged on the way, but we've got to keep our eyes on God because he helps us get to the end. The only way you'll get to the end of something is not just being positive, but it's trusting him and holding on to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8 says that he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. You see, we've got to trust God fully. We mustn't be swayed. We mustn't waver. The pressure is on young people and they're taking strain today because we're being bombarded with all kinds of ideas, all kinds of alternatives, all kinds of temptations. And Paul says, yes, it's, it's tough, but you need to trust God because he'll keep you strong 
to the end. You know, we're being intimidated today, tempted and swayed and ridiculed and, and even accused, but we've got to stay our course, especially young people when we face challenges in life. And there's so many voices, but you must ignore them and just keep going because we're going to get to the end with God. There's a well-known story that was told about a captain on a dark, misty night who was uh, captaining a battleship. And as he sailed through the mist, he noticed lights just up ahead. And immediately he thought, we're on a collision course with whatever's up ahead. So he told the radio, signal out to those lights, alter your course 10 degrees south. And promptly came the reply, alter your course 10 degrees north. And so the captain got annoyed because he thought, what a cheek. And so he sent out another message and he said, alter your course 10 degrees south. I am a captain. And immediately came back the reply, alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a seaman, third class. Well, now the captain really got annoyed because he's a captain and, uh, and, and he's in charge and here's the seaman telling him what to do. So he sends out another message, alter your course, he says, 10 degrees south. I am a battleship and instantly comes back the reply. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I am a lighthouse. How many of you know you can shout, you can declare that you're a captain, you're a battleship, you've got rank, but the lighthouse will not budge because the lighthouse stands and warns us of danger. And we're hearing so many voices in the mist that are attacking us and telling us and trying to take us off course, but we need to stand on Christ our lighthouse and not be swayed because he is our guide and will keep us. And God's righteous people need to see the end from the beginning. You know, I love Psalm 112 because it talks about the righteous. It describes people that are righteous, the characteristics and qualities they have, the attitude they have to life. And it's too long for us to read the whole thing. But one of the qualities of a righteous person, and we're righteous in Christ because we trust in him, not because we're good in our, own, in our own right, but because we trust him. But one of the qualities of a righteous person is mentioned in verse seven. And I want to read it to you because it talks about how we trust God. And it says of the righteous, they will have no fear of bad news. Isn't that great? Every time the news report tells you how many are infected and how many are dead, we won't have any fear of bad news. Why? Because we see the end. And then it says, their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Can you see how important it is? When you trust in the Lord, you see the end. And then it goes on to say, their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. Watch this. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. Can you see why God's people are triumphant? It's because they fully trust God. Their eyes are on him. Their eyes are on the end. And no matter what's happening to them at the beginning or in the middle, they know God will get them through in the end. I don't know what you're facing today, but maybe you're facing a whole lot of challenges. As I hear the prayer requests and praise reports and as we pray for people every day, I'm astounded at what people go through. And I really, my heart breaks sometimes from our program Life by Design. People write in and I carry those requests before the Lord. And I'm quite staggered at what people face. But I always realize that no matter what you face, God can get you through and he can give you victory. In fact, I was reading about a man called Lawrence Hanratty. And Lawrence Hanratty was nearly electrocuted, got a massive shock. He was working on a construction site uh, way back in 1984, and it put him into a coma for several weeks. Well, finally he woke up and uh, he, he got lawyers to fight his case for him because he was dis disabled. But then he lost his lawyers. The first one was disbarred. The second one died. And then while he was trying to look for a new lawyer, his wife ran off with her lawyer. And so he was even in a worse predicament. And then he spent years fighting this case. He had liver disease, heart disease. And while dealing with that, he was in a car accident. Now, being, going through all that's bad enough. The police arrive at the car accident, they take all the details, and as soon as the police leave, some robbers come and they rob him at the scene of the accident. And uh, he is telling the New York newspaper, he said, I, I would say to myself, how much more am I going to be tested in life to see how much I can endure? But he went through 10 years of agony with his health, uh, right up till 1995, 
And then in 1995, an insurance company threatened to cut off his compensation benefits. His uh, landlord threatened to evict him from his apartment. He went through uh, depression, started to suffer from uh, agoraphobia, which is the fear of, of open spaces. He carried a canister of oxygen that he had to suck on, and he took 42 pills a day to deal with his heart and liver ailments. But with the help of neighbors and friends, he's not giving up yet. And this is what he said. There's always hope. You see, when you see the end of something, you can go through numerous difficulties, sin, suffering, temptations. And you need to trust God because when you trust God, you can see the end of suffering and you can see God doing something just like he did for Job. He can give us restoration. I'm looking forward to the end of this pandemic, to restoration, to us being back in church, worshiping together, and for all of us to be rejoicing, for businesses to be thriving, new opportunities to open up. Don't look at the start of it. Don't look at the middle where we are, but keep looking at the end. Number four, let me quickly give you this. See the end result of what you decide, not the beginning. So many people don't see the end when they make decisions. What decisions are you making now? See the end of that decision. When you buy a car, don't just be excited about the new shape and the bargain. When you buy a new home, see the end. What does it mean? How long am I going to have to pay it? Am I going to be able to maintain it? I'm getting married. Don't just feel that euphoria because that's what happens at the start of anything new. See the middle. See the end before you make decisions because things can be very appealing but in the end, they can turn out badly. Solomon advises us here, giving us wisdom, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. He says there is a way that appears to be right. In other words, it's attractive. But then he says, but in the end, it leads to death. You see, something can seem so right, but in the end can be so wrong. And we've got to be careful of first impressions and attractive temptations because things always look amazing and yet in the end they don't turn out well. If you think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the devil came along and he looked attractive that he was offering wisdom. He could be as wise as God. Life would be better, but they never knew the end of it would be suffering, the fall, banishment from the garden, sickness and pain and hardships. They didn't see that end. And often you have to see the end before you make a decision. Now, let me just pause you to get to something very serious. Because in the midst of what we're going through, people are still making very bad decisions concerning relationships because they get caught up in the start. They think this is amazing. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. But in the end, it wrecks homes and families. Solomon advises us here in Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 3 that things in the beginning are not the way they are at the end. He says here, for the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey. Oh, they're sweet, he says. And her speech is smoother than oil. Wow. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. Those high hills that attracted you, men, they take you straight down to the grave. There's a huge contrast between the beginning of an affair and the end of one. In the beginning, it's hard to resist. It seems like the best thing for your life. So no one's ever loved me and treated me like this. But in the end, it destroys your soul and it destroys your life and it destroys the lives of others. We have to think about the end when we make decisions. That's how we make our end better than our beginning. Because many people start out well with their marriages but they end very badly. So I want to encourage you to make wise decisions and to keep going. You know, sometimes when you make wise decisions, people will laugh at you and mock you, especially when you get married or you start the Christian life. Sometimes when you start giving in a church, the family around you go, why are you giving so much money to the church? Are you mad? And they criticize your walk with God. But you need to keep going because the end of it is blessing. The end of it is favor with God. You know, in Matthew's gospel, there is the story in chapter 26 of Mary, Mary of Bethany, who went to the home of Simon the leper and she broke open an alabaster jar and she poured out a, an expensive ointment onto Jesus' feet and began to wipe them with her hair. And, and the disciples, not, 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 not the, the atheists, the disciples said, why this waste? Could have been sold and given to the poor. And so the start of her giving seemed to go all wrong. But Jesus pointed to the end of what she had done. 
He said this. He said, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing. And wherever the gospel is preached, she will be spoken of concerning this. You see, it might look bad that you started by doing this generosity and giving and, 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 and this commitment and faith. But I tell you what, in the end, God sees it as good. Think through your decisions because the beginning is not the same as the end. Number five, as I come to a close today, believe that the end of this life is better than the beginning. Believe that the end of this life is better than the beginning. I'm not being negative here. I'm not saying, hey, gosh, you need to believe in death. But think of this. Was the birth of Jesus more important than the cross? No, it wasn't. He was born to die on the cross. The end where he died for our sins was actually better than his birth. No doubt he had to be born, but his death was better. Is the, the, the heavens and the earth we live in better? No, the new heavens and the new earth actually that we're looking forward to is much better. No global warming, no problems with the ecology, no problems with the balance of nature, no problems with sin and crime. We look forward to something better. So is our birth better than our death? Well, actually, Solomon says your death is actually better than your birth. And he's not using it in a negative sense. He's not saying, oh, I wish I could die. Life sucks. And, I, and I'm so depressed and I can't wait. Give me a tablet. No, he's not talking about euthanasia. He's talking about the truth here that the end is actually better than the beginning. Or even the middle where life can really be hard. Notice here Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He says a good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. This is not the negative ramblings of a depressed man. He sees the end is actually better than the beginning because the end of a matter is where God is taking everything. The start of something is initiated. The middle of something can be difficult, but the end is where God is ultimately taking us. Even Job, when he went through his suffering, he saw the very end, not just the end of his suffering and restoration, actually saw the end of his life. And he made this confession. As I come to a close, Job chapter 19, he says, I know that my my Redeemer lives. And in the end, he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. He's not just looking at the suffering and what he's going through and saying, oh, I'm looking forward to when God's going to bless me here. He's looking right to the end of his life. And he's actually saying, you know, when I die, it's actually going to be better. And I'm going to see God. And then he says, I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another how my heart yearns within me. He sees the resurrection. And so I want to just encourage you today. We need to see the end, not the beginning and not the middle. It's not how you start. It's how you finish that counts. Are you looking at the, 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 the middle of what we're facing right now? We might be in the midpoint of this pandemic. When we go back to work, we need to look back at that. When we go back to being normal, when we go back to church starting, we're in the middle of a lockdown and a pandemic right now, but the end is in sight. Keep your sights on what's coming and what's ahead because even though we're going through something very difficult at the moment, God's using it to change our perspective and to change our priorities. Well, as I come to a close, I'm going to pray with you today and uh, just commit you to the Lord and help you to see the end, not just the beginning. If today you don't know Jesus, while you're in the middle of something, maybe you're feeling, man, my life's not worth it. I wish I could die. I met a lot of people are suicidal today. Uh, they just wish life would end. And when it ends, I think it'll be over. But for the Christian, life makes sense. Suffering makes sense. And the end is actually going to be better than the beginning. So let me pray for you as a believer today. And if you're not a Christian, maybe you can open your heart to God. Let's pray this prayer. Read on the screen with me as I pray with you today. And let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you that you start things and that you take us through things and you help us to endure. And sometimes in the middle, it seems so difficult. But thank you that you're the God of endings. You're the God of beginnings and you're God of endings. And so we thank you today that we can come to you what you started in the Garden of Eden, you end in a garden in the book of Revelation, in the new heavens and the new earth. We come to you today to renew our faith, to restore us, and to help us see the end from the beginning. And Lord, we come so that we might have hope and salvation and see the end of life as the beginning of something wonderful and beautiful. We open our hearts to you today, pray for you to save us and to change us. In Jesus' name. Amen and Amen.
Well, church, we hope you've been inspired by another fantastic message by Pastor Andre. If at the end of the service you made a decision to follow Jesus, we'd love to give you a bit more information about the incredible journey that lies ahead of you. So feel free to head over to our website to get some more info. And if you'd like somebody from our team to get in touch, please do feel free to leave your details as well. Well, that's it for church today. But before we say goodbye, I just wanted to remind the ladies that are watching, the 28th of August is our next Sisters Evening. Now, August is Women's Month. Month. So we've been doing some incredible things on social media if you're following us on those platforms. And we've got a very, very special evening planned with Pastor Vilma and her girls. So diarize it and you do not want to miss that Sisters Evening. But for now, Goodbye, be safe, and we will see you next week.